Hello, my name is Amber. Welcome to my channel. If you are new here, I just like to talk about plants and dirt. Today we are just going to do a quick plants for beginners slash basics covering terminology, different types of substrate and also a little bit of information about repotting. So let's just get right into it and we're going to start with our terminology. First of all, we have a rhizome. A rhizome is a root-like stem that can grow horizontally over or under the topsoil, producing new leaves and shoots. Next up, we have aerial roots. They are roots that develop above the surface and come off the nodes. These aerial roots can help anchor the plant to the pole or tree that they are trying to grow up or even a trellis. And they also can help the plant to breathe as well node. Um, a node is a point of attachment of a leaf or um, a twig where aerial roots or regular roots can grow from. That's also where you cut and can propagate from. And the nodes are often, not always, but are often formed on the stem, which is the main axis of a plant. So, for example, if you have a plant like a Monstera adansonii, they have a stem and the nodes actually form on the stem. But some plants have what's called a petiole, which is what joins the leaf to the stem. So a petiole doesn't have nodes. The stem would have nodes. So if you had a rhizome with a philodendron gloriosum, for example, where the rhizome or the stem is running across the top of the surface, that will actually have the nodes there. Whereas the petiole that connects the leaf to the actual stem or the rhizome where the nodes are doesn't actually hold any nodes. So if you were to propagate a plant like a philodendron gloriosum, you would just simply cut the rhizome rather than cutting the leaf off. So for example, I have here a wandering dew, which doesn't have petioles. The leaves grow straight directly from the stem. So you can see here that for example, this would be a node, this would be a node, this one here would be a node. So they're all potential growth points. So if I was to propagate this plant, I would cut it here, just below the node. And this part here will grow new roots and the plant will continue to grow out the top. Whereas, for example, if I had... A plant like my Snow Queen here, you can see that this is the main stem and then from the stem the leaves grow. So this would be the petiole. So if I was to propagate this plant, I know it's quite difficult because they're quite compact at the moment, but I would chop, where's a good example here, I would chop here where there is a node on the main stem, there is starting formation of an aerial root, and this would actually grow your roots, and the plant can continue to grow. So that is where this here is the stem, and then these are the petioles. The bit of stem that connects the leaf to the stem. That is a petiole. And last but not least, um, a terrestrial plant is simply a plant that grows outside of the water, so grows on the land and not in water. Next up, we're going to talk about the different types of substrate. First of all, a very common, most common, dare I say, soil. There are different types of soil, but the main difference here is what is a soil and what is a soil mix. So a soil is simply, in the nicest way possible, plain dirt that doesn't have adequate um, elements for growth. Whereas a soil mix has different um, 
other substrates added into the soil that are specific for the plant that you're trying to grow. So for example, you can get soil and then add your own substrates in it like perlite, peat moss or bark and create your own soil like that. Or you can buy a soil mix that is specifically for, for example, cactus or orchids or uh, aeroids. So if you do go down the soil route and you're not comfortable or ready or feel like you're informed enough to start blending your own soil, don't get plain dirt. Like I wouldn't dig it straight out of the ground and just decide to try and grow it like that. Um, I wouldn't buy just plain soil. Go specifically for like a indoor potting mix that is well draining. So for example, may already have um, orchid bark or perlite mixed into it. A lot of them do have slowly releasing fertilizers. Honestly, there's nothing wrong with the soil that's sold at Bunnings or your local supermarket. It just doesn't have the same capability to drain. So that is where you would want to add in, for example, maybe some rocks or some perlite. Um, even your little garden stones make a big difference. Rule of thumb that I use is if you can grab a handful of that soil and squeeze it, if it clumps together, your roots aren't going to be able to breathe and your plant is going to suffocate. So that is where I steer clear of if it's just plain soil, it's where I steer clear of like even any indoor potting soil. If it's branded as just plain soil, I wouldn't buy it. But I would, as an emergency, run and gravitate towards an orchid mix um, for any aroids, so your philodendron, your monstera, etc. Or purchase a cactus sand or a cactus soil mix. If it's got the word mix after it, it's going to be better than just your plain soil. Next up we have Lekka. Lekka is a... Um, clay hydroponic pebble which is basically expanded clay in the shape of pebble I believe it's also known as like lightweight expanded clay aggregates but I haven't heard it like that we usually I've just heard lecker um, or your hydroponic pebbles so the pro of these is that they boost root aeration and they also can aid towards preventing soil borne insects and pests so that's where I would worry less about bugs like gnats and mealybugs. Um, spider mites are different because they tend to feast on the actual plant itself, but gnats definitely go straight to the roots and your decomposing um, organic substances. So lecker seems like a really great idea. You can also top dress your plant. So on top of your substrate, put some lecker to conserve the moisture. Um, so to keep the moisture in the plant, I think that would be a great idea if you're going away for a couple of days. Put the lecker on top and that prevents it from over, for, prevents you from overwatering and killing your plant. But it also allows for the water to kind of condensate within the plant and allow it to redisperse. A new substrate is pon. My understanding is that Lechuza is the only company that sells pond they've created this it's called lechuza pond um i haven't done a lot of research into where else you can get this but straight away i found it's not available in australia it's available to most of the uk um america canada etc so where we can actually use this is creating it ourselves so basically it's just a non-organic mineral plant soil or alternative to, to soil so it can be made at home with pumice, lava rocks, and zeolites. A pro to that is basically it aids your aeration. It does provide, because it is a um, mineral plant soil, it does provide the plant with the nutrients and minerals that it does need. Um, I don't know a lot about it, but I'm assuming that you probably wouldn't need to worry too much about an over or undercompensating mineral balance um, or nutritional balance in your plant because it is made specifically for plants. As I find out more information, I will also update this as well. Next, we have perlite, which is a excavated mineral rock. I believe it is a volcanic mineral rock. I may be wrong, but that's what I think. 
Um, it prevents the soil from compacting and suffocating the roots. So that's where you would add it into that plain soil. If that was all you could get was plain soil, add perlite because it is going to stop the soil from compacting. So again, if you were to grab a handful of it and squeeze it, it's still going to stick together, but it's not going to stick together as much. Uh, it also allows for your soil to adequately drain the water and the toxins as well, because if you don't have well draining soil, it can actually build up the toxins and therefore poison your plant from the inside out, essentially. The only negative that I have found with perlite, and this is over a very extended amount of time, is that when you're mixing your soil with perlite, once you water it, months, sometimes even years down the track, the perlite sinks to the bottom. All you really need to do is, as you go to fertilize it, you can scoop it up with a, with a fork or a spoon, kind of mix it up a bit more. Or if you need to repot the plant, you can use that same soil and just remix it. Lastly, we have sphagnum moss. Now, before you start running down to the shop and buying this amazing product, there is a potential environmental issue, issue here. So please do your own research to make sure that this product aligns with your values. The issue here is that sphagnum moss is a living plant that grows on top of a bog. In order to harvest this, they scoop up the sphagnum moss and then they actually use decomposing sphagnum moss as well, which is called sphagnum peat moss or peat moss. The issue here is that the sphagnum moss on top, yes, it is able to rejuvenate and regrow. It does take a very long time to grow, however. But the sphagnum peat moss, which is what is most easily accessible at the moment, is actually the dead and decaying sphagnum moss that is sunk to the bottom of the bog. So to harvest this, they actually drain the bog and then harvest it from the bottom. And very rarely do they reintroduce the ecosystem that they just destroyed. So there is a massive, massive issue going on at the moment with the ethical side of sphagnum moss so if you are going to buy sphagnum moss please 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 do your research and find an ethical provider i've also tried to look at growing sphagnum moss and there you see the problem because we can't grow sphagnum moss to have a supply that matches our demand whereas the earth can that's why we're harvesting it from the earth and that's actually a really really sad thing the problem is that because we're draining the bog water and not refilling it, that whole ecosystem is gone. So we're also affecting and microorganisms in that area and we don't know what else we're affecting in terms of the plant life, etc. However, a really good thing about sphagnum moss is that it can be reused for a very, very long time. It does die and decay, but it can still be reused. So for example, I haven't bought sphagnum moss purely because I just can't get my hands on it. It's sold out everywhere. But the plants that I have bought that have been shipped to me in sphagnum moss, I have been able to reuse that sphagnum moss. It is fantastic for growing roots on plants um, or air layering, which is another video I can do if you're interested in different types of propagation. Um, air layering is one of them, so comment below if you would like a video on different types of propagation. But basically sphagnum moss can hold a huge amount of water it, you could get some sphagnum moss drench it in water pick it up and it's going to expand and then you can spend ages just trying to like wring it out and that's a fantastic thing about sphagnum moss is that it does hold a lot of water however because it does hold a lot of water if that is constantly pressed up against your root growth point it can actually rot your roots so it's something that you do need to be really mindful of to keep it moist and not wet my go-to tip is touch the top. If it's crunchy, I spray it a little bit, like with a spray bottle. And then if it's in a container for condensation, I'll close it again. But because I have such high humidity in my plant room, I don't put any container lids on anything. I just give it a quick spray and then the humidity will keep it quite um, moist. Finally, we have repotting. If you are going to take your plant out of its nursery pot, so the black pot that you buy it in, with its drainage holes like this. If you were going to take your plant out of its nursery pot, please, 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 when you repot it into a pot, make sure the pot has drainage holes. For example, if I was, I keep using the same plant. Maybe I'll use this one for something different. 
if I was to repot my philodendron florida and take it out of its nursery pot, so the pot with the holes, and repot it in this pot here, it doesn't have drainage holes. So this is why I use it as a cover pot, and that's why it's they're called cover pots, because they're supposed to cover your nursery pot. If you were to repot this plant in just this white pot, there's no drainage holes, the water is going to stick to the bottom, and you're going to stick your finger in to check if it needs to be watered, and the top inch is going to be dry. So you're like, yep, I'll water it, but little do you know, this much of the plant is actually really, really wet, and that is how you're going to get root rot. And because root rot exhibits signs that are so adverse and different to each plant, you could think it has a bug problem, or you could think that it needs more watering, when really it's just suffocating and drowning because there's no aeration. So... If you are going to repot your plant into a cover pot, make sure it has drainage holes down the bottom and adequate drainage holes at that as well. For example, this plastic pot could have holes drilled into it down the bottom, fantastic. But I don't know why people pot their plants in cover pots even if they do have drainage holes because you can't even tell that the nursery pot is sitting in here, right? And when I water it, the water is obviously dripping out of these, um, what are they called? Dripping out of these drainage holes and it's getting caught by the cover pot. So all I need to do is take the plant out, see if there's water in there. If there is, tip it out, put it back in. Whereas if you're drilling holes into your cover pots, the water is just going to seep out and ruin whatever furniture you've got underneath it. Unless, of course, you have like a plate or a tray or something, but why make more work for yourself? I don't understand it. Anyway, lastly, self-watering pots. You can get self-watering pots everywhere. There are so many different types. My issue with self-watering pots self-watering pots encourage the roots to grow through your pot and they get stuck in these like in the little um grates in the bottom of the pot right for example i have one here okay so for example this is the self-watering pot it's a really big one i'm sorry but this little bit here Mine's broken, but this little section here is where you can fill the water up or you can water it like normal. So basically, you're filling this all up with soil, you're putting your plant in, and then the water sits under here, right? And so in order for the plant to get to the water its roots are going to be drawn down there and then you're going to end up with roots that are stuck in here i still buy self-watering pots purely because they tend to be cheaper than cover pots i don't know why but i don't particularly like them and i don't use them i don't use self-watering i don't use these self-watering pots there are a few self-watering pots on Amazon and also on the La Chusa website that I would purchase if I could, but for some reason they don't tend to ship to Australia. So if you are going to buy the self-watering pots from Kmart, by all means, please do, but use them as a cover pot or just be mindful that your roots may be growing through the crevices in there. And so just check it as often as you can. And again, that's going to be difficult because you don't want to be pulling your pot your plant out of its pot all the time but look it is what it is it is what it is that's all for today guys if you like to see more plant content from me please like and subscribe and watch the video from start to finish leave a comment on anything that i could improve on and let me know what else you would like to see Bye.